This is the Kyle Malnati Show. Our podcast provides an opportunity to expand your knowledge, and it's our goal to make real estate investing more approachable to everyone. Each episode, we tap into the mindset of real estate experts and share their stories. Live from Seattle, Washington, you are watching the Kyle Malnati Show. I'm your host, Kyle Malnati, and we have a special edition of the show today. I'm sitting here with real estate superstar, Kendra Todd. Kendra has so many accolades, they're almost too many to mention. She is a realtor, and uh, the way that I've gotten to know Kendra is we've been talking about a book that I'm working on because we were both recipients of a prestigious honor called 30 Under 30, which Realtor Magazine does every year. And we met last year during, uh, during the reunion. And uh, so Kendra, thank you so much for spending some time with me today. And I appreciate you just being willing to talk about real estate best practices. And, and this is a lot of fun for me, so thanks. Yeah, this is a lot of fun for me. Good. I would never turn this opportunity down. So this is exciting. <laughs> so I, I know some of your story and I'll intro that, but I'd yeah. love for you to talk a little bit about that too. You're probably most uh, most known for uh, obviously winning The Apprentice in season three, I, I remember yes. researching. and. So um, spending time uh, in, in real estate is exciting, of course, but when you can do that on a national platform, uh, really, really cool stuff. And so tell me just a little bit about what that experience is like about being on The Apprentice and, and uh, fast forward to today and if there's lessons that you've learned um, you know, that are a direct result of just kind of having that national platform. Yeah, that's a great question. So the experience of being on The Apprentice Certainly for the viewers was entertaining. Sure. For me, it was not entertaining. <laughs> it was super hard. It was the most challenging experience and journey I've ever gone through. And, you know, I, I think the ultimate lesson that I learned um, was that I'm capable of achieving way more than I ever gave myself credit for sure. under pressure. I think that you don't oftentimes know how you're going to respond. Um, in a, a pressure cooker situation. And, you know, in, in the entire experience of filming The Apprentice, they uh, made sure that we, first of all, it was super competitive. Right. Um, I mean, the, the, the tasks felt nearly impossible. I really felt like MacGyver. Like, here's five bucks, a piece of gum, and a toothpick. Go build a skyscraper <laughs> in two days. You're like, yeah, sure, I'll get right on that. So it was super competitive. You know, they made sure that we were working on a team with people who had um, conflict. Yeah. You know, because that makes good television. Oh, sure. Create um, that drama. Yeah, you got to create that drama. So you still you have to push through that and, you know, still focus on the goal, you know, and, and achieve victory even though, you know, your teammates sometimes, you know, get in your way. Yeah. Um, and to do all of that uh, with no privacy and virtually no sleep. Right. And I don't know about you, but I kind of need eight hours of sleep yeah. to be truly functional and creative. So I remember watching the episodes with everyone else and it was airing and I'm like, why did I think that was a good idea? I'm like, I think I'm brilliant. But I think when you're really sleep deprived, I mean, you think you're a genius. You sure. Just, you know, things are just a little warped. But, you know, having gone through that for six weeks and, um, not just surviving, but learning how to thrive. Yeah. Uh, was really transformational for me. Uh, and after that, you know, I really had very little problem taking taking risks. I feel like that really exercised my risk threshold, you know, in, yeah. a, in a pretty major way. And, uh, you know, it really changed how I approached, you know, all future opportunities in business and my personal life. You know, yeah. I live with no regrets. I'm willing to say, you know, say how I feel, say what I mean, give it a go. I mean, what's the worst that can happen? You fail. It's not yeah. a big deal. Well, and that's a lot yeah. of what this book that I'm writing is, is all about. And we've talked about that is really, and a lot of people have likened it to John Maxwell's book, Failing Forward. Yeah. You know, these opportunities that leaders and entrepreneurs get, you know, things are not going to work out perfectly at all times. Yeah. And I think that that process of, um, of really thriving amidst chaos is some things that you see in uh, in the military and yeah. some other different uh, things. And, and in real estate, I think a lot of times we um, over-dramatize that. And I think most people assume that it's going to be this crazy 
um, situation where you know buyers and sellers are screaming at each other. You picture this big boardroom or this big closing where everybody's you know totally mad at each other. And most of the time, our job as realtors is really to keep things comfortable and yes. keep things stress-free. It can be a stressful situation, but I think TV obviously makes wants to create that element of, of huge drama. Yeah. Um, but that thriving amidst the chaos, I think in that large platform I, I keep calling it, um, really I think it marked you and marked the way that you have been, uh, have, have learned to be successful. And a lot of it's through making mistakes and failure. Yeah. Um, one thing that I, I picked up listening to a podcast while I was on a run uh, actually here in Seattle a couple of days ago is one of those things where I felt like it was perfectly timed uh, as I was doing some research for our interview is John Rich, uh, Big and Rich, was a winner of the Celebrity Apprentice. And John Rich in this podcast, it's the Entree Leadership podcast that he was on, was saying that Donald Trump, um, it's real interesting how he's a very physically imposing, like large guy. Yeah, he's super tall. And like you're shocked the first time you right? meet him. You're like, wow, he's really got a presence. Yeah, and he said yeah. that Donald naturally, when um, kind of digging in, leans forward. Yes. And at the at the boardroom table, at the dramatic scenes at the ends of each episode, he's talking to, to John Rich, and John Rich is describing the situation where Gary Busey was one of those kind of crazy teammates and uh, yeah. Donald leaned in to John Rich and John said he leaned right into to Donald and, and they, it was one of those situations where it just was his natural tendency you felt like he immediately broke the tension yeah. because a lot of times I think Trump is used to having people kind of be intimidated and, and naturally move backward and so it was just kind of an interesting way that he described that and I think for you you've probably learned a lot of lessons having that experience and, and just having to thrive amidst the chaos I think that's oh, yeah. cool um, so the next question I have for you is that we had talked on the phone uh, as we we're prepping for this book that I've tentatively called Calibrate. And Calibrate's all about learning through failure and learning, um, learning through uh, just you know course corrections and making iterations to get better. Mm -hmm. um, and you had mentioned to me that your grandfather left a wonderful legacy for you. And I think it was your grandfather. My great grandfather. Great grandfather. I'm yeah. sorry, I didn't, go, I didn't go to the right generation, but your great grandfather. <laughs> Would you tell the audience a little bit about that and just how that how that marked you and how that's got you reflecting on how your investment world um, can leave a legacy on future generations? Yeah. So you know, my my great grandfather was one of the most special people I think that ever walked the earth. I mean, yeah. I miss him to this day, and uh, he was just a really humble guy with humble beginnings in um, backcountry Louisiana. Cool. And after the Great Depression, he formed, he started a farming um, company, mm -hmm. and he sold, you know, farming equipment. He developed some technology that helps um, elevators go up and down in silos. Oh, and, sure. But he was one of those guys that um, he did business on a handshake. Yeah. And if a farmer, you know, was just having a really tough year or a hard month, he would just shake his hand and say, "I know you're going to pay me back." Pay me back when you can, and I and I think because of the the kind of man he was, everybody always paid him back. I don't think there's one person that that ever yeah. you know didn't didn't pay him what was owed, and you know I think God really blessed him, and he built this great business, and um, he was just such a generous man. He uh, was a wise investor, and mm -hmm. so he made sure through uh, wise investing that he was able to put his children through college, his grandchildren through college and all of his great-grandchildren wow. through college. And as you can imagine, as the generations go on, I mean, that's a, that's a lot of people. And, you know, I, I felt really fortunate when I went to college, knowing that I could choose wherever I wanted to go to school. I had friends that were crying because their only option was a state school because sure. um, their parents couldn't afford to send them where they yeah. wanted to go. And, and I totally and get that. they were lucky, too. Yeah, because lots of people exactly. came to go to college. And yeah. a lot of people came to go to college. And I had friends that had to take out huge student loans. And, you know, so I, I really, that really impressed upon me, you know, how much I want to leave a legacy yeah. for future generations of my family. And um, my besides my my great grandfather, um, on that side of the family, there's no other entrepreneur. So I was like the odd duck out. Yeah. You know, my family's all government and military, which is so amazing. Mm -hmm. But I didn't fit any in, in any of those boxes. Yeah. So you know, when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, how I was going to leave this lasting legacy, um, you know, there was never a question that I was going to build something 
for myself. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that with legacy, we talk about this all the time on my podcast that, you know, legacy for real estate investors yeah. is really, really important. It's, it's one of those purpose driven um, thought, thoughts that people have that allows them to step into some risk. And I think that if you um, if you just take a risk and you don't really have a reason for it and you don't have a, a purpose and you're not really answering the question why as you step into that risk, it doesn't mean much. And what I've found for most of my clients is they invest for several simple reasons, one of which is to put their kids through college. Yeah. And that's, they look at it and say, this can be a vehicle that will allow if I invest correctly and it yields a return and a cash flow, it'll allow my kids to go to college. It also allows them then to, to live a wonderful retirement. Uh, where they don't have to, to work until they're 75. They don't feel like they are you know, strapped down from a job with a job that they don't really want to work in. Um, and then it allows them to pass on wealth uh, to the next generation. Um, one of the better um, interviews we've done is with a guy named Bo Mankey, who's a Keller Williams yeah. agent also. And Bo's a developer and yeah. he, he was very, very passionate about real estate investing. He says it's one of the things that people uh, real estate across the world is one of the things that people fight about and have wars about. Yeah. A lot of it's territorial in nature. And he's like, it's also one of the greatest uh, levers that you have to pass on wealth to the next generation. And, and also, it, if it's done improperly, you can lose wealth uh, very quickly. And so it's, it's, it's interesting as generationally, people um, that instruct their children and their children's children the right way to really maintain that wealth and grow it. And I think that legacy story about yeah. your great grandfather is so Thanks. cool. Well, I, I just, you know, I was 23, didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. And somebody handed me Rich Dad Poor Dad by Robert yeah. Kiyosaki. And it just, I mean, it just blew the lid for me. I mean, I, I had no idea that there, that you could look at, you know, money and opportunity that way. So I got my real estate license, bought my first investment property when I was 23, never planned on being a real estate broker and helping other people do it, yeah. but it just kind of turned out that way. So the, like the whole, the, the whole reason I'm on this path is because my goal was to develop passive streams of income yeah. through real estate investing. Yeah, so and it, it's, that's, it's that's still the goal to this day. Absolutely, yeah. and I think the more that you do it, the more exciting it becomes, the more opportunities it allows, and it allows you to give to the community as well. And I think that's the, I think that's what I found from a lot of real estate owners is that you, you're having this interaction. It's not just the investment; you're having interaction with tenants, and you're providing safe, affordable places for people to live at times. And um, really, uh, the good landlords are are real stewards of what they have. Um, and provide a wonderful place for, for people to live. And I think that's important to think about too. A lot of people assume that investors are just into it for the riches and you know, that's a part of it, it's a byproduct, yeah. but people do it so that they can uh, really make their communities better and, and stronger. And I think Absolutely. that's an important part of it. Well, I think I, I love that we're having you know the dialogue about this because I, you know, I'm as you, I mastermind with a lot of top real estate brokers, yeah. go to a lot of real estate conferences and you know, learn so many wonderful things about how to grow a super successful, you know, real estate team or real estate company, but that's not my end game, yeah. you know, it, it, at all. Um, I enjoy it, but it feeds, you know, my real passions, which is in continuing to invest in real estate. And I just, you know, I, I wish that there was more of a dialogue, even within the real estate community, of, of, you know, people talking about, you know, really what the, the most important goal should be. Yeah. Um, I don't want to be selling homes when I'm 80 years old. I want to be in a beach somewhere. Yeah, what exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, a, it's an important segue to what I do so often is I help, especially the residential real estate community, I help residential realtors um, buy and sell investment properties for their yeah. own retirement. And I think that's really important. There's so many really, really successful agents and salespeople that, that make great annual income, but don't put it away or don't invest it in such a way that they they feel like they're gonna continue having to work into their 70s and into their 80s, and that's unfortunate. Because I think there's a, there's a point in life, not to say that you can't be productive at, at those ages, but yeah. I think it's, there's, there's a different level uh, of, of thought that I think you, you wanna have when you're in your late 60s and early 70s, and, and I feel like, Real estate investing gives you options, and I think for for gives realtors, you freedom. gives you freedom absolutely. Yeah, and uh, I think for realtors, you have you have the ability to invest in your markets and really understand it. And uh, I think so many people pass up on that. So I I, I yeah. really appreciate that you brought that up. And um, I uh, I found that so many of, of the investors that that we work with, and one of our prior guests had shared this, that a lot of people mistakenly look at real estate investing 
as, as what people should actually call speculation. I think speculation yeah. and investing are two very different things. I think a lot of people look at fix and flips and all these other things as kind of how can I make this short term dollar? How do you approach yeah. investing long term? Because I think it is, it is a long term game. You really have to think yeah. about what I'm going to be like when I'm 80. So how do you approach that? Well, uh, I've learned a lot of lessons the hard way. I talk about feeling forward, yeah. um, really costly um, mistakes in my real estate investing career because when I first got into the market, I was living in South Florida yeah. and uh, I, I got into the industry about six months before the market took off. Mm -hmm. And in, in Florida, it really took off. We're talking 60 to 70% appreciation yeah. in one year, wow. year over year over year. So properties were tripling, quadrupling in value. I mean, it was insane. Crazy, yeah. And I thought it was a party that was never going to end. Yeah. And what most people were doing, and I was working with a lot of investors, actually mainly investors early in my career, they were buying pre-construction uh, properties, uh, then the developer would have price increases, and then by the time it was built, they'd have this huge margin, and then they'd immediately sell it after closing to make a killing. Mm -hmm. But you can only, you know, and, and as far as I'm concerned, that's a, that's, that's a type of flip, for sure. Sure. You can only repeat that so many times. Absolutely. Until you get in trouble. Yeah. And, and the uh, music stopped. I mean, yeah, oh, the music, yeah. it went screech. I mean, it was, I mean, the record got scratched. It was bad. And, um, you know, people got, they got left hanging with real estate that they couldn't sell yep. and that they couldn't afford to, to pay the mortgage on. And so, you know, I feel really blessed that, you know, all the property that I acquired during that time, I still own, I still make those payments. They're yeah. all rented but several of them and it's been 11 years several of them are still not worth what i bought them for it's amazing it's crazy yeah. but you know that's that's when i realized through that experience that speculative purchasing is if, if, if that's what your goal is yeah. don't invest in real estate i mean it's just that's not what it's about so now everything that we acquire if it doesn't cash flow and cash flow well from the beginning we're not touching it with a 10 foot pole. Yeah. Any type of um, equity that we build in that property is a bonus. It's the cherry on top. Absolutely. But as long as that property um, you know, has great cash flow, I don't care what the market does. I don't really care what the property's worth. I've, I'm cash flowing every month and someone else is, is um, paying down my mortgage, mm -hmm. the principal on my mortgage. I mean, it, it's that simple. Um, so I will say this though, I think Flipping homes is super fun. Yeah, um, it's exciting. I, it is. And that's why people like it, and that's it, why there's yeah, tons of it, TV shows about it. And we do it, but it's not. Um, it's it's not our main focus. It's not our main goal because, you know, there are certain times during markets where it works, and there are certain times where it doesn't. So it's always there, and during you know the the right real estate market, we'll we'll rehab and flip. I don't know, a couple homes a year. Sure. Maybe four or five homes a year, but. Right now, we're not really doing a lot of that yeah. because uh, of where the market is, you know, Absolutely. especially in our area. Well, and I think if you buy properties that have good return on them, you don't have to focus on that. You can if you decide that you feel like there's a great deal and you feel like it's a good short-term huh. um, property to, to go through that renovation process. But there's so many pitfalls with you know, selecting the right contractors and what happens 18 months from now when, when, when the market shifts or yeah. someone, I mean, I've seen so many situations where someone runs away with, yeah. with uh, deposits or, and advances on, on, on those. And yeah. it's just, it's, it's a much different market. And I think that people mistake investing with speculation. Yeah, lot. big time. So I, th I think that that's, it's wise advice. And you've obviously seen it in the trenches with, with a lot of your clients and what happened. I South saw a Florida. lot of people. I saw a lot of people go, uh, go into foreclosure. Yeah, a lot. And that's tough. And I yeah. saw that even just at the beginning of my career, um, because I was a little bit further behind you when I started. Um, it, it, and it's just, it's really sad uh, to see that. But I think what what ends up happening is people get in over their heads. They they focus on something short term, and usually, what the component there is um, that gets them in trouble is debt, because yeah. they've got way too much debt. Uh, they're they're not thinking of things conservatively and. It leads me to a quote. I've been I've been reading your book as I <laughs> as I'm looking forward, to, and I'm going to put this here just so that uh, that everybody can see it. So Kendra wrote a book 
um, just it, it's really about facing fear. Yeah. As, as, as I'm reading um, different parts of the book, it's really risk is all about how you measure fear yes. um, and how you how you react to it. And one of the things I love that you said, and I share a quote on all of my podcasts. So this is apropos. Um, here's my advice in your words: Go for security in your personal life. Build a great family, find a home you can cherish, build a circle of friends you love and respect, then start getting daring in your business life. You don't have to become fearful and conservative as you get older. Having a solid, secure foundation frees you to take big risks, shoot for the moon, and go out on a limb. And I love that advice, because I think, as I was reading in that, in the context of it is, you know, really create this strong base at home yeah. and it allows you to, to take these risks at work if you're an entrepreneur. And that's really where you end up um, making your, your big wins is, is in your business. And I, I'd love to hear just kind of as you thought about writing that and as you were speaking that, how that's, uh, what your reflections are on that today. Because this book is about 10 years old now. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think these truths all hold for me, for sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I just think that, you know, if you have people that are always, always going to be rooting for you, that are always going to be there for you. Mm -hmm. um, I think it really eliminates a lot of the fear of failure. You know, what is my spouse or my family or my friends, what are the colleagues, what are, how are they going to view me yeah. if this doesn't work out? But if your business success or failure uh, is not tied to those personal relationships, I mean, you just have, you have total freedom to, to just give it a shot. Yeah. You know, why not? Uh, because you know, at home you're you're loved and you're loved well, and it it doesn't matter. I so, think it's great advice, yeah. and, and I think that's really key. If there's that person that's watching that might be looking at stepping out into something new, yeah. something exciting, um, I think that it, it's it's important to say go ahead and do that. And yeah. if you've got a strong base at home, if you've got things set up well, and if you've got you know your emergency fund and your rainy day fund and you yeah. can step into that you know yeah. you gotta have an you gotta have a rainy day fund yeah. <laughs> you have to but, but it's great i mean my my husband i mean i'll come home and say guess what honey you bought a property today yeah. <laughs> you said in the book yeah. it's like buying you buy property like people buy shoes yes like other women buy shoes. yes although i do have a lot of shoes now <laughs> over the last 10 years i i don't know the, the balance is may have shifted but um, you know, he doesn't freak out. He's like, yeah. oh, that's great. He he trusts me implicitly and my judgment. Yeah. And, you know, and that means the world to me because if I felt like he didn't support me or he was going to question or want to analyze and break down, you know, why did you buy this property? What was your decision? I, I think it would change everything for yeah, me. Yeah, absolutely. Just, this is, you know, this is where my expertise is and go for it. I mean, he... The sky's the limit. It so. reminds me of one other thing you wrote in that same chapter yeah. about how you how you can confront that that risk and really conf overcome your fear of failing. And you had said persistent, consistent action makes uh, excuse me means that once you jump into your risk, you don't stop working until you realize the reward, and you always act according to your plan. And what I remember reading there is that really it's. Once you're in that situation where you've made the decision, you keep working your tail off. Yeah. I think as your husband's probably seen that yeah. over and over and yeah. over again, he knows you're resilient and he knows I've got a plan, I'm working my plan, yeah. and it's it's gonna end up being successful because I'm gonna keep working. Yeah, it's kind of, it's kind of like a, a piece of art in progress. I mean, like you look at the canvas and if you're not the artist, you're just like, oh, it's not looking real good right now. Yeah. But you can't, I mean, you can't question it through the process, you right. know, because it's, you know, there are times in this journey where it's just, it's going to be tough. You're going to have to grind it out. And, you know, you're wondering why you signed up for this in the first place, but you just got to keep your eye on the prize. Absolutely. And I, I'm a firm believer that, um, and I operate a lot on faith too. Right. And my faith in, in God is really important to me. Yeah. So if, if, if I am, have embarked upon something and I know that I can get to the end um, of the journey without relying on God or without relying on anybody else, then I probably shouldn't be on that path. Because, you know, I think it's important to, to say yes to opportunities uh, that are going to help you grow as a person, that are going to help you push through um, whatever your self-imposed you know, barriers or limitations are. And I think it's important to always be doing that, to yeah. consciously say yes to um, climb the, the steepest mountains, you know, yeah. like where you need, you need help along the way. Um, Cause I don't, I don't think it's ever fun to, 
it's a, it, it's not satisfying to um, achieve success on, on your own. I mean, it, it, and it's nearly impossible. I mean, it's all about the people that are around you. Yeah, you know, for part of that journey. When we were before we uh, started filming the interview, we were just chatting about yeah. about Dave Ramsey, and yeah. Dave is a guy that I've actually got to meet a bunch of times in the last two years. Awesome speaker, and yeah. I've been to several of his um, kind of smaller events and had a chance to interact with him. And Dave is real famous for saying that if it was up to my plan, you know, all of a sudden it'd be real yeah. small what I actually accomplish. And he's like, what happens so many times is he's like, I I I pray. And I pray and I pray, and what ends up happening yeah. is God gives me opportunities I could have never planned on on yeah. my own, and it's it's incredible. And um, I, I think the other component of what Dave says a lot of times is um, pray like it's it's God's responsibility, but work like it's yours. Yeah. And so Amen to that. it takes, takes yeah. both of those things because God's going to make it rain, but as using yeah. the farmer example of your great grandfather, you've got to be out there reaping and sowing and, and pray yeah. for it to rain. So and you just never know. Do you think this was part of the plan? Yeah. I mean, the apprentice, well, yeah. she I mean, like all of that. Yeah. Sometimes I'm like, did that really happen? I yeah. mean, you just never know. Absolutely. Yeah. I think being grounded in faith is really, really important. Yeah. So I, I've appreciated your time uh, in just being able to, to share your platform and, and be able to talk to me about real estate. It's really been gratifying for me. And um, this has just been one of those pinch me moments for, for me. So thank you for spending time. And I'm yeah, so happy exactly. that you're, you're helping with the book as well. So um, I'm going to end up getting you to sign this too. Cause that's that's, fine. I'd love for you to sign a copy, even though it's uh, it's an oldie but goodie now. It, it is. It is an oldie but goodie. But okay, I'll sign this uh -huh. for you if I get an autographed copy of yours Absolutely. when it comes out. Yeah, so, you guys all heard it here. <laughs> <laughs> so on that, you know, Calibrate should be, uh, should be finished within the next year. Uh, it's been a really interesting process of learning what the publishing world is like and all that, but I would absolutely love to give you a signed copy. Cool. So Kendra, thank you so much yeah. for, for being on the show. To our viewer, uh, you, you're you what makes this show happen and what makes it work. And so, as I love to say, for Kendra Todd, my guest, we will see you around the neighborhood. Thanks, everybody.